This is Dr. Mobin Sayed from the FLCCC platform. Today we will continue with our episodes for the long story short with Dr. Bean. Today's discussion is very interesting. Let me give you a summary now and then we'll go over the details. In this research, you would see that the near infrared light, it's actually invisible to our eyes, near infrared light, about 720 nanometers wavelength, reduced the inflammation in human cell cultures by 50% and reduce the production of interleukin-6 by 80%. Interleukin-6 is a very important mediator of inflammation. So let's see how did they do that and what is the possibility of using this therapy. Let's quickly look at a couple of sites as well. So this is the FLCCC site first. So if you see here, Dr. Corey implores colleagues to protect patients. Then there is an upcoming discussion with Dr. Keith Berkowitz and so on. Down here, if you see, there is this long story short. And if you click on this one, you will go to Odyssey where all of these discussions about long story short are present. Nowadays, Dr. Paul Merrick and I am specially looking into the autophagy, intermittent fasting, and the ways to clear our body of whatever, unfortunately, the trash that is collecting spike proteins or maybe after the infections or other such recyclable material that our cells are unfortunately collecting. So please keep an eye on these talks. And in October, there is an FLCCC conference as well. If you would like to attend, you can go on the FLCCC site too. And of course, you are aware that there are many protocols here for prevention and protection and a long haul and vaccine injury. This is the study that we're going to talk about. The study is infrared light therapy relieves TLR4 dependent hyperinflammation of the type induced by COVID-19. There is a comparison to the kind of dysregulation, immune dysregulation that we see in COVID-19. Although this is an in vitro study on human cultured cells or human cells that are cultured and these cells are expressing TLR4. So you can say they are macrophage-like cells and dendritic cells-like cells. So in addition to that, if you would like to understand a little more about near-infrared spectroscopy, that is here. And this is a great video by, I believe, Dr. Mike about red light therapy versus infrared. He talks about near-infrared and infrared. So I'll talk about that as well, but just some references for you. All right, so let's start. So first question, what is near infrared light? So look, we have a light that is visible to us. And we know that that light is over here. This is visible light. However, at the same time, there is light that is invisible to us. And there are wavelengths of the light that are invisible to us and are below are the wavelengths that we can see. These are ultraviolets or X-rays or gamma rays. On the other hand, there are also light waves that are above our visible light range. And the top range for our visible light is red light. And that is about 700 nanometer wavelength. Just above the red light, just barely above it, is the near infrared. So above the visible light is the infrared light spectrum. Within the infrared spectrum that is here, there is near infrared and it is called near because the wavelength is very close to the red light of our visible light spectrum. For example, as you can see, visible light is 700 nanometers and the near infrared is 720, even seven up to 750, but 720. Then there is a middle infrared as well and there is far infrared too. Now, please keep in mind, near infrared is safe for eyes and for our body. Far infrared is safe as well. However, far infrared is something that you can feel in the sunlight or in the campfire. So it does produce heat. The far infrared is thermal. And so that thermal property of far infrared can cause burn. So there is an important aspect that it is actually not harmful. If you're standing in sun, it is not harmful. But depending upon the exposure and intensity, it can become harmful. On the other hand, near-infrared doesn't have that. For example, in this therapeutic experiment, the near-infrared proposed or suggested is 10 minutes exposure, and that only changes the body temperature or the temperature of the area being beamed by 5 degrees centigrade. 
so not a problem so this is the near infrared there is a lot more theory about this you can watch dr mike's video now in this experiment what they did was they found out and there were other studies as well that discussed it the spike protein of the sars cov2 can cause toll like receptor 4 on macrophages to become activated and cause cytokine storm and we'll discuss that a little more now this behavior of the spike protein to trigger a macrophage through toll like receptor 4 is very similar to the behavior of lipopolysaccharides that are part of some bacteria so some bacteria in their walls have the lipopolysaccharides and when these lipopolysaccharides are very offending to our immune system so when they touch the tlr4 sensors on our macrophages or dendritic cells they create a potent response from these cells and the inflammation and aggressive inflammation starts there are studies that show that the purified spike protein so here let's say this is the purified spike protein we have a bunch of them in this dish over here and here are bacterial lipopolysaccharides there are studies that show that purified spike protein produces or triggers a similar level of cytokine storm as the exposure to lipopolysaccharides through the tlr4 receptors and again these tlr4 tall like receptor 4 are sensors on macrophages dendritic cells and other cells too but here we're talking about macrophage and dendritic cells so once the macrophages are become triggered by the spike protein or the lipopolysaccharides then they start releasing the cytokines or inflammatory mediators question then becomes how do they do it what is the mechanism that this happens so let's look at that so before we go to the mechanism an excerpt from this study they said that as the lipopolysaccharides or the spike proteins cause the cytokine storm to occur or mediators to be released the inflammatory mediators if in the experiment the resorvid is present which is a tlr4 inhibitor then this effect of lipopolysaccharide or the spike protein is actually blocked this is their proof to say that we are on the right track that as you put the spike proteins with the macrophages or the cells that are expressing tlr4 and there are mediators produced if you put some sort of a tlr4 blocker then those mediators are not produced or reduced so once we understand that all right this is tlr4 related or mediated then let's go inside this macrophage or inside the dendritic cell let's start from here imagine on this macrophage that you were seeing before on the outside there is spike protein or lipopolysaccharide and they are connecting with the tlr4 and there is signal here so this area is the outside signal that has become transduced on the inside so inside the cell there is a protein that is called i for inhibition ik beta or i kappa b kinase or ikk protein this enzyme when activated by the tlr4 receptors activation so for example imagine tlr4 receptor is a doorbell so when you press the doorbell on the inside something happens right so there is a doorbell inside that rings similarly when the tlr4 is stimulated on the outside then inside the doorbell is this ikk protein when this ikk protein becomes activated what it does is this so if you see here this is a crux of our discussion today there are two main concepts in the discussion today this is one of them there is a protein in macrophages and dendritic cells and actually many other cells as well that protein is called ik beta alpha or b cells alpha so ikb alpha protein this protein is an inhibitor of nf kappa b cell or b nfk beta these two proteins down here rel a and p50 together are called nfkb nfkb is a enzyme complex that is responsible to help produce inflammatory mediators like interleukin 6 like tum tumor necrosis factor and interferons right so pay attention to these two guys and keep in mind that these are nfk beta or k b cells these are usually kept suppressed by sequestering them by attaching them to ikb alpha 
Now, when the IKK becomes activated because tau like receptor 4 is activated, then IKK comes in and phosphorylates this inhibitory protein. This little blue structure here is the phosphorylation. Phosphorylation means to attach a phosphate. This is a mechanism within our cells to, we can attach a phosphate to something and that can either can make it activated or deactivated. It can change its function. Here, when the phosphate is attached to this little protein, the result is that this protein becomes marked for ubiquination, that is destruction. So really, the signal outside TLR4 is eventually causing this inhibitory protein to be destroyed. So when this little IKB alpha is destroyed, then these two little guys, REL A and P50, which together are called NFKB, these become free. Can you imagine this? So within the cell, the NFKB is actually hugged by another protein. And we want to release the NFKB to start the inflammation. So what do we do? We shred the protein that is hugging them. That makes the NFKB free. And now this free NFKB enters the nucleus through a nuclear pore. So this whole structure here is the nucleus. So NFKB enters the nucleus. It goes in and attaches to various genes that it will work with to express them. Once those gene expressions occur, messenger RNA is formed. That messenger RNA comes out in the cytoplasm, works with the ribosome, various kinds of proteins are formed, and a cell response occurs. Would happen, for example, in this specific case, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, alpha interferons, these will be released. And these would start the inflammation in the local area. And we know that if this process occurs in too many cells and intensely, then the cytokine storm can occur, which can even kill a patient. So then what happens? So I hope that now we know that activating TLR4 is not just a very innocent thing. It actually starts the war. So what do we get? We get interleukin-6, 8, TNF-alpha, interferon-alpha, and interferon-beta. I was too excited about this diagram. <laughs> so I drew this for you. So check this out. The experiment that they did is called photobiomodulation. The photobiomodulation is actually short periods of illumination with infrared or near infrared light given repetitively over several days. Now please also remember infrared light is difficult to penetrate in our tissues. Near infrared penetrates better and because it penetrates better for example in this experiment the authors talked about a patient of COVID and giving them the infrared light therapy and they said infrared would not really help because it will not penetrate very deeply so they need to be given the near infrared so that it can go deeper in the chest tissue and help the pulmonary tissue chest tissue so here remember i said there are two important concepts for today this is the second one the mitochondria inside the cells when the near infrared light is beamed on a cell the mitochondria that are inside the cell their function changes they start having oxidative bursts in them that actually is regenerative and that is anti-inflammatory so really the inflammation has started with the tlr4 signal however if you activate the mitochondria in this person's cells then the mitochondria would help reduce the inflammation by doing more oxidative bursts and especially in the case of COVID, we know that any respiration or improvement in mitochondrial function actually reduces the risk of COVID intensity. So this is the second core mechanism. This is how near infrared works. And there are actually many more mechanisms that I would continue to present one discussion at a time. This is one of them. Now, according to the authors, the benefit of near infrared light compared to, for example, drugs, for example, to silizumab for IL-6 blockage, is that the drugs have to be given to a person, they have to be ingested, they have to be absorbed, they have to go throughout the body. Here, you can just target the near infrared lamp to the area which is affected and just help that tissue. So here is the experiment. What they did was to prove this idea that near infrared would help, the two cell cultures, these are HAK blue 
HDLR4. So these were the HAK cells that were expressing TLR4 receptors on them. So one cell cluster was left without the near infrared. They actually tested them with the near infrared, with infrared and with incandescent light as well. So they tested with various ways. But one group was not exposed to light. The other group was exposed to various light wavelengths. So they had, for example, 750 nanometer wavelength. They even have incandescent lights. They even had the infrared light and they kept those lamps 20 centimeters above the cells. And they would give 10 minutes beam every 12 hours for 48 hours. Now these cells were annoyed or were triggered by lipopolysaccharides on them. So if you see these little things around them, these were the lipopolysaccharides. So these cells were triggered by lipopolysaccharides and they had TLR4 receptors. So the expectation is that these cells would start producing inflammatory mediators. And that is what happened. The only difference is that those cells that were kept in the dark, no pun intended, those cells that did not have the light shining on them, they produced more mediators compared to the cells that were having the infrared, near infrared and the incandescent lights on them. They found out that the best result came from near infrared, which is actually very fortunate for us as well because near infrared is much easier for us to tolerate. The second thing they said was that lesser than 10 minutes didn't have enough effectiveness. Greater than 10 minutes didn't have enough benefit. It was 10 minutes that was very useful. So they said, don't think about too much about the nanometers, 720, 750 is okay. However, duration is important to control. So what happened was 50% of the inflammatory mediator volume was reduced for the cells that were getting the light therapy. And as I said before, 80% of interleukin-6 production had reduced. This is actually beautiful. And so if you see here, they tried 720 nanometer light from 2 watt per meter square to 6 watt per meter square and they meter square and they found them to be equally beneficial so now let's look at some of the graphs that they have so here if you see this is the inflammatory response and the down below is the light intensity so the bars that are marked with the asterisks are statistically significant data differences so if you see here, light intensity 1 to 6 watts per meter square. And if you see 6 watts per meter square was the best. Similarly, if you see here, this is the time dependence. So if you are giving a burst of 720 nanometer near infrared light, this is control. These are the cells in the dark. They have this, let's say, the value of the mediators produced is 100. 5 minutes of the light burst almost had similar effect and it was non-significant as well. 10 minutes had a significant improvement and then a reduction in inflammatory mediators and then 15 minutes also did not have much benefit. So this is what they repeatedly stress in their manuscript that make sure that you are aware that the time is 10 minutes or something like that, not more and not less. Then if you see here, these are various inflammatory mediators, IL-6, interferon alpha, beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-8. So if you see here in all of them, the first bar is the control. The second bar is LED. Third is incandescent light. Fourth is incandescent light high. And the LED is the near infrared. So if you see in all cases, these two, LED and IC low, they have statistically significant outcome. Look at this, tumor necrosis factor alpha with the therapy almost lesser than 50%. Here, these are just amazing results. Then this is the interleukin-6. So here, the cells exposed to interleukin, exposed to lipopolysaccharides, the bacterial toxin, that really is an offending toxin. No lipopolysaccharides, this is a control. If you give the lipopolysaccharides to cell, then this is the outcome. If you have lipopolysaccharide plus infrared light, then look at this, 80% reduction. So then they have a few practical considerations. But before I go to these last two slides, if I quizzed you and I said, how does near infrared light work for this specific case? The answer is 
that near infrared light modulates the mitochondrial function and allows the respiratory bursts to occur in them. The result of that is that the toll like receptor 4 mediated or triggered inflammatory marker production and inflammatory mediator production is reduced by 50% and IL-6 reduced by 80%. So it is the mitochondria TLR4 and reduction of the mediators. Here they're talking about the practical considerations. One, they say, unlike most current applications of photobiomodulation therapy, treatment of lung inflammation requires deep, uniform penetration of light into the chest cavity. And so if you are a physician and you are thinking about near infrared light, if it is specific to chest cavity, and that is the lung tissue, then this is a very useful advice here. Otherwise, if it is skin deep, then it doesn't have to be this way. So what they're talking about it, unfortunately, many LED-based photobiomodulation devices on the market do not provide either the necessary intensity or a suitable wavelength for deep tissue penetration. Red light, for instance, does not effectively penetrate beneath the skin surface and generates high heat, as is true also of infrared heating lamps or incandescent lamps, bulbs, which emit at wavelength above 900 nanometer. Exposure to many such lamps at the intensity necessary for chest therapy would result in burns to the skin, for example, an incandescent infrared light. Further practical considerations are with respect to the time dependence of the therapy. See, I said that they talked about time again and again. Exposure time have to be quite precise as even 5-minute variation renders the treatment ineffective. So once again, 720 to 750 nanometers or near infrared light instead of infrared penetrates better in 10 minutes and maybe twice daily. And then the risk factors. Authors say, apart from the danger of skin burns at a too high exposure level, photobiomodulation therapy has no reported risks or risk factors and has been approved for a range of medical applications. So this is the discussion. One more time, the third time I'm going to repeat this. The cytokine storm in many of the infections, bacterial or SARS-CoV-2-like infections, cause the macrophages and dendritic cells to go mad when their TLR4 receptors are activated. TLR4 receptor activation releases the NFK beta or NF kappa B cell protein, which in turn causes gene expressions in the nucleus, which in turn causes the formation of various inflammatory mediators that are released from the cells and inflammation starts. If the near infrared light is given, Although they, they had infrared and incandescent as well, but the near-infrared finally was the one that was the most suitable. That's why I'm using the word near-infrared. When the near-infrared is light is beamed, one, it penetrates in the deeper tissues. Secondly, it should be only for 10 minutes. And thirdly, it causes the mitochondria in the cells to become optimal and start functioning, doing better respiratory bursts, which in turn is regenerative plus anti-inflammatory behavior. That is how inflammatory mediators are reduced. 50% overall reduction and 80% reduction in interleukin-6. So that is the discussion. We will continue with this near infrared and look at its other benefits and mechanisms as well. Thank you very much for listening in. I would speak to you next. Bye-bye.